traffic in US cities is a large issue. For instance, in Los Angeles, the average commuter spends nearly five cumulative days a year stuck in traffic. In Midtown Manhattan, the average car travels 4.7 miles per hour. That's barely faster than the average walking speed. So which is faster, walking one mile across Midtown Manhattan or taking the same route using a rideshare? To test this, producer Zach Green went from 47th and Madison over to 47th and 10th Ave in a car while I walked the same route. Okay, so right now I've been walking for about four and a half minutes and I'm pretty sure Zach is eating my dust. Yeah, uh, this is the fabled start and stop of New York traffic. About five minutes and 45 seconds into this ride, we're finally crossing 6th Avenue. And I don't know if you can see it, but we just passed Liam. We just passed him. Yes. He passed us again. He passed us again. Okay, so right now I'm about three-ish avenue blocks from final destination. His Uber ended up diverting to a different path, so going straight across just to avoid some of this heavy traffic. Here we go, we did it, we did it, all right. There he goes, my champion. We're at 10th Avenue and 47th Street. I want you to see this, see that right there? 11 minutes, 56 seconds. We beat Liam, we beat him. In fact, here he is right now. How do you feel being beaten by superior technology? Um, by how much was it? Uh, I got I, I got 11 minutes 56 seconds. Okay, I got like 1545. That's so honestly not that much. That's just a couple minutes. So driving in this area is barely faster than walking. Zach beat me by a few minutes, but his trip also cost $15 and emitted about 400 grams of CO2. However, the constant honking and need to dodge traffic proved to be quite unpleasant for my walk. But just a few years ago, this street was quiet and mostly car free when COVID-19 hit New York. During the pandemic, shutting down streets to give businesses and pedestrians more outdoor and social distance space was a common trend. But this concept of car free communities or even cities is becoming more popular. So it shows this, this change in preference where people actually want to be in dense urban cores where there's reliable transit and amenities within walking distance. As traffic rates rise and congestion becomes a bigger problem in large cities, designing neighborhoods and communities around people and prioritizing public transportation instead of cars seems like a no-brainer. It's imperative that we make all of our high-density places as pedestrian-friendly as possible to encourage people to walk 10 blocks instead of looking for a cab, for instance. A recent report found that nearly 7,500 pedestrians died in 2021 after being struck by cars, the highest number in 40 years. In US cities like New York and San Francisco, turning more streets into car-free areas is becoming a popular proposition. It's about also turning the city of New York as the most pedestrian and friendly, pedestrian and cycling friendly in the whole nation. People are recognizing that value has to be placed once again on the human condition in the city for it to be successful. 2021 was the deadliest year for New York City in about a decade, with 124 pedestrian and 34 cycling and moped deaths. But there's actually a rather simple solution to this problem. In 2009, after a spike in traffic accidents, the city closed off Broadway right next to these sections of Times Square and Herald Square. I think there are a lot of places around the city or in all five boroughs that would benefit from that kind of treatment. Initially, when this was turned into a pedestrian plaza, there were worries that tourism and consumerism would decrease. I, the whole project could be renamed Controversy. <laughs> I mean, it was controversial from, from the day we began. Foot traffic is actually up about 15%, and Times Square still sees 360,000 visitors a day. Turning the area into a pedestrian plaza brought pedestrian injuries down 40% in Times Square and 53% in Herald Square within just a few years. 
Still, though, the controversy was warranted. And nobody had re really ever done anything like this in a city like this. New York is a special place, and there's only one Times Square. And now the several hundred thousand pedestrians who pass through Times Square every day can more safely look at the large advertisements in all their glory. Uh, I think it's, it's proved itself over and over. It, it is a very good example of what you can do when you take space away from single occupancy motor vehicles and, and give it to people on foot or on bikes. This concept is known as autoloo in the Netherlands, roughly translating to nearly car free, where pedestrian and bike friendly plazas are extremely common. This Dutch urban planning environment is what inspired the change in Times Square. Just as the change was controversial in New York, it was in Denmark too. So controversial that when this concept was rolled out on a street named Stroll in 1962, Copenhagen's mayor of town planning received death threats and had to travel with bodyguards. And it's become like one of the most successful pedestrianized streets within Europe. And it's even, it's even been a source of like international inspiration. Nearly car-free zones in cities like Copenhagen or Amsterdam singularly allow public transportation and emergency vehicles to use roads, making buses and emergency responses much faster. But in American cities like New York, cars still usually take priority. Right now, nearly a quarter of Manhattan is dedicated to space for cars in the form of roads and parking. That's a greater amount of space than two midtowns. But if you remove all that traffic, suddenly you have a giant street with nothing to do. So it's got really wide lanes and tiny little sidewalks. So you could see how those streets could be made into more real estate. You could build in the street, potentially more apartments. You could create parks in the street. You could widen the sidewalks. You could make restaurants in the streets. You could do so many things with the space left over that is provided for uh, cars today. There is one project in the U.S. putting this concept to the test. Cul-de-sac is a real estate developer building a car-free neighborhood in Tempe, Arizona, with retail space, e-bike garages, over a thousand bike racks, on-site EV car share and rideshare pickup zones. Every immediate need is a short trip away for residents of the community. It is also partnered with Lyft, giving residents a discount, and it connects to the local light rail system. The Tempe neighborhood is expected to open to residents later in 2022 and will have more than 600 homes once complete. It has raised $200 million in real estate capital so far, and the company says it has already started on its next set of neighborhoods in growing cities around the U.S. While there are other car-free communities and vacation destinations like Mackinac Island, Michigan and Bald Head Island, North Carolina, Cul-de-Sac markets itself as the first community built in the U.S. that's explicitly designed to be car-free but it represents a larger trend. Young people broadly are kind of dissatisfied with the status quo of what cities look like. I, th there's this big push for like walkable cities and transit rich places. And I think that you're starting to see that with this generation. That's Paul Stout. He's amassed a substantial audience of over 200,000 followers on his TikTok account, Talking Cities. The cool thing is we've been building cities for people for as long as we've been building cities. Stout largely appeals to Gen Z about the benefits of good urban design, city planning, and mass transit. It's something I've seen too with like, just within TikTok and YouTube and all sorts of other social media is like, this sort of like urban planning space has just kind of blown up in the past couple of years. Younger generations are more frequently seeking alternative modes of transportation to driving. And you can see this in a number of trends, but I think the, the first one I point to is the drop in Gen Z getting driver's licenses. And that drop is substantial. In 1988, 77% of 18-year-olds had their driver's license. Now that number is around 58%. This means they're relying on Uber, Lyft, bikes, or public transportation more. But public transportation can still be unreliable in some cities. One of the, the biggest obstacles to more people taking the bus now is that they're not reliable because they tend to get stuck in traffic behind uh, private motor vehicles, and, and if you get a lot of those private motor vehicles out of their way, then the buses will be a lot faster. Some groups have pushed for the reprioritization and the implementation of car-free zones to ease congestion in much of Midtown and Lower Manhattan. This is something that many of us saw in our neighborhoods with the initial spread of COVID. Streets and parking spaces around the world were replaced with areas for outdoor shopping and dining. That I think really opened up a lot of people's eyes to the, the potential for reducing the amount of car traffic in New York City. You were able to 
across the street, walk down the middle of the street in a lot of places, and um, that lasted for a few months. It, there was a big boom in cycling at the beginning of the pandemic. People felt it was you know, a, a safe way to get around. A coalition of over 80 groups, including unions and public health organizations, backed a goal to convert 25% of New York City's space taken by cars into space for people by 2025. And New York City only recently started adding bike lanes at a rapid pace, including protected lanes that have a barrier keeping drivers from parking or swerving into these lanes. As part of a street safety plan, Mayor Eric Adams announced over $900 million going towards protected bike lanes, designated bus lanes, and tracking reckless driving. Uh, for far too long, uh, our cities have been just basically vehicle focused. Now the city is working on adding an additional 250 miles of what's considered Class 1 lanes. That's 2.5 times the amount of protected lanes that were constructed from 2007 to 2018. And it took a spike of cyclist deaths in 2019 to get the city to begin prioritizing bike-related infrastructure. We've made great strides with, uh, with cycling in New York, but there's still like a significant room for improvement. There's likely a segment of the population who doesn't feel it's safe to ride yet. And when you prioritize bikes and other modes of, modes of transportation in the way that we currently prioritize cars, you see a lot more use. But of course, we can't forget about the cost. For the redesign of Times Square and Herald Square alone, it was around $90 million. And I would say that that number is quite deceptive because a great deal of it, I believe 40% of it, went to things underground that you can't see. Creating pedestrian-centered areas almost always comes with contention. Locals worry about a lack of consumer traffic, delivery-related issues, and emergency vehicle access. And it's just completely not not the case. And you, you look at thriving downtown areas in, in European cities that are, you know, mostly pedestrianized streets, and, and you know, business is great. The quality of life is great. People are happy. Consumer traffic often booms so much so that the economic output in Times Square outpaced the rest of New York City by nine percent from 2007 to 2012. Now, does this mean that Times Square should be recreated everywhere? No, it does not mean that. It only means that in dense urban conditions that have suffered for many decades, it's possible to reevaluate those and place in new design strategies uh, that also help organize the infrastructure in these areas uh, for a better future. To change the status quo, local governments can either use persuasion or punishment. The persuasion being increased cycling infrastructure, pedestrian plazas, and public transportation. And the punishments being reduced parking space, paid parking within a city, fewer gas stations, and congestion tolls. Um, probably you should try everything that anyone has ever wanted to deal with that. New York City could be implementing tolls by the end of 2023 that would charge drivers $23 to enter the lower third of Manhattan. Some cities that have cameras to enforce against drivers failing to yield to pedestrians who are crossing a street with the light in a crosswalk. So that's a, an aspect of technology that uh, could certainly be deployed. There are, you know, with, with congestion pricing, you can do variable tolling that um, changes by time of day or based on, on tra the, the amount of traffic volume at a given time. However, congestion tolls and paid parking would greatly favor those who can afford it, and having a car could quickly become a luxury for the more fortunate. So Prieto Curiel suggests persuading could be more effective, charging time instead of money, making driving and parking inconvenient and time-consuming could have a potentially greater impact. What if public transport was faster than the going by car? What if public transport you have a station close to your home, one station close to your destination, and you know that you can get there faster than by driving. Eventually you do. Eventually you actually switch into this system. Recent technological advancements like sidewalk delivery robots, rideshare apps and e-scooters and bikes all play major roles in making a community like cul-de-sac feasible. While some might have hoped we'd be traveling in pneumatic tubes and flying cars, considering some fans say George Jetson was born in the year 2022, futuristic forms of transportation are unfortunately a bit more down to earth. 
there are many ideas and many things that smart cities can help become more friendly and more livable for everyone. Right around my house, people tend to leave their scooter so that going from my house to the metro station, I can just grab one of these scooters and get to the metro station within three minutes. Well, certainly in recent years, especially with all the kind of personal mobility gadgets that appeared on the sidewalks and on the streets, there's a great deal of experimenting and willingness, I think, to try out those things. Personal cars are usually parked 95% of the time, taking up an enormous amount of space. And many people think that rentable, autonomous electric vehicles could be the answer. Having cars that we only have possession of when we need them, are always in motion so they don't take up parking space, use clean energy, and can pick you up and drop you off with the use of an app seems like an ideal scenario, right? Definitely, no. I, this, this is one of the tricks that has happened throughout decades. That is, we just need one extra bit of technology and that is going to help us. Then this is going to be perfect, right? All these technological ideas that an autonomous car is going to fix our city sounds exactly what they were saying in the 50s. But what works? Metro, public transport, something that is shared, walking, cycling, something that is active mobility, something that doesn't require an individual infrastructure because that's the issue with cars. In metropolitan areas, there's also been a noticeable push to rejuvenate mass transit systems. President Biden and the U.S. Department of Transportation announced a $20 billion investment in public transit this year. In their prime era, there were around 17,000 miles of streetcar lines in the U.S. But by the 1950s, loads of American streetcar networks were rapidly becoming obsolete in the face of a vehicular revolution. Cities like Los Angeles used to be largely dependent on their streetcar network, but now the City of Angels is notorious for getting you stuck in traffic in 90 degree weather with essentially no convenient public transportation options. However, in 2017, Los Angeles started to show a shift in priorities and announced it would be spending $120 billion over 40 years on its transit system. Kansas City had one of the most substantial streetcar systems in North America that began operation in 1870, initially being pulled by horses. But by 1957, the entire system was shut down, making way for cars which were becoming increasingly popular. But starting in 2014, the city began reconstructing a modern streetcar route that's nearly identical to the last one that was in operation about 60 years prior. Once there's an emphasis on the quality of the public realm, you're making life better for many, many people. And there's a lot of, I, I would call it like incumbency bias with um, car-centric design. Like so much of the U.S. looks like this and we're so used to it. So it's very easy to look around and see like examples from Japan and Singapore and like Western Europe and many places that are like significantly more walkable. Um, I think that a lot of young people have seen that online and they've been like, hold on a minute, why don't we have that? 